Hello and welcome everyone to episode 63. Today I'll be looking at a particularly fascinating aspect of fungi, the wide variety of chemicals that they create as part of their natural life cycle, as part of their life strategy, and as part of their symbiosis with other organisms. To establish an ecological relationship, be it parasitic or symbiotic, the fungi has to generate various chemical compounds, like signaling molecules, hormones, alkaloids, you name it. In this episode, I'll look closely at some of the most common and some of the most fascinating fungal chemicals, and how the fungi use them to engage in and survive in the natural world around them. I want this episode to have a broad-stroke approach, where we cover the major groups of fungal chemicals. Now, a lot of these have medicinal effects in the human body, but I'll talk about those chemicals uh, more specifically in episode 72, which will explore the many ways in which humans use fungi. So, first and foremost, I want to talk about the chemicals that are involved in the greatest symbiotic relationship of all time, the arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi that grow into and around the roots of larger vascular plants, so as to feed the plants with water and nutrients, in exchange for the sugars that the plants produce with photosynthesis. On an ecological scale, the interwoven roots of plants and the hyphae of fungi create a kind of biological mosaic a massive living network of water flow and nutrient exchange that spreads across much of the Earth's surface, permeating throughout the soil. On a molecular level, this symbiosis is a complex biochemical interaction that begins with host recognition by the fungus, and symbiote recognition by the plant. The host plant will release chemicals from its roots, called branching factors, which will encourage the hyphae of the fungi to start branching wildly. These branching factors include a group of sesquiterpene lactone chemicals called strigolactones, which the fungi can recognize as the signal of a potential plant symbiont. It can tell that it's, it's near a plant that it can engage symbiotically with. The sensing of these strigolactones thus begins the response mechanism of increased branching in the fungi, and root integration, and everything that follows. The fungal response involves the generation and expression of its own biochemicals to both initiate its own increased metabolic activity and cellular growth, and to prepare the root for the incoming hyphae that will establish the physical nature of this symbiotic relationship. When the fungi reacts to the root exudates, it activates genes related to oxygen consumption and cellular respiration, like mitochondrial size and morphology, so as to fuel the metabolism for the intensive growth that's needed to build the symbiotic tissue. In the fungal species Gigaspora rosea, one of these activated genes codes for a protein called pyruvate carboxylase, which plays a critical role in mitochondrial metabolism. To loosely quote a scientific paper that analyzed these gene responses, pyruvate carboxylases catalyze the reaction of pyruvate and CO2 to oxaloacetate. Previous reports showed an active CO2 dark fixation in G. intraradices germinating spores, and a synergistic action of carbon dioxide with root exudates on growth stimulation of G. rosea. If the fungus needs CO2 for its metabolism besides its own reserves, the 10 times upregulation of the pyruvate carboxylase is necessary to incorporate more effectively this additional carbon source into oxaloacetate. This oxaloacetate, in turn, would be needed for various processes important to sustain fungal growth activation and branching phenomenon, like gluconeogenesis for cell wall or ribonucleotide synthesis, amino acid biosynthesis, etc. Unquote. All right, now that was a mouthful, but essentially what they're saying is that in response to the plant signal, the fungi will begin to branch and grow to integrate its hyphae into the root tissue. And naturally, all of this growth requires a lot of nutrients and oxygen to fuel all of the metabolic activity. And this is why the fungi will engage in the opportunistic early expression of an enzyme involved in respiration. Without this boost to increase its oxygen consumption and thus its energy production, the fungi would not be able to sufficiently fuel the cellular growth that's needed to merge with the root. 
In essence, the fungi is ramping up the energy to prepare for this, this metabolically expensive act of integrating physically, symbiotically, with the plant's roots. Alright, so we have increased gene expression and mitochondrial activity within fungal cells when they respond to plant exudates. But what about the other way around? Do fungi exude stuff that stimulates plant roots and gets them prepped for a symbiosis? The answer is a presumable yes, although this particular aspect of fungal biochemistry is not very well understood. There isn't much data on it, but we do know that some kind of fungal exudates do exist, and their presence is tightly associated with symbiotic activity. We just don't know precisely what they do or how they work. For example, when the Gigaspora fungal hyphae are growing in close proximity to plant roots, but haven't yet merged into the, the physical symbiosis, they've been observed to secrete some kind of chemical signal that will induce a response in the root. As observed in the roots of the Metacago truncatula plant, this signal will cause the expression of the early nodulin 11 gene. As observed in the roots of the Lotus japonicus, this signal will cause the expression of the species' calcium-binding protein 1 gene. Now, both the early nodulin 11 gene and the calcium-binding protein 1 gene are specifically expressed when the plant is engaging in this fungal symbiosis. The calcium-binding protein 1 gene specifically is associated with lateral branching in the root to increase the surface area for fungal attachment. Now this is really cool, because it's kind of like having an insight into the chemical dialogue, or the chemical conversation that happens between a plant and a fungi as they meet and court each other for a symbiosis. Another cool aspect of this plant-fungal symbiosis involves chemicals called volatile organic compounds, or VOCs, which include stuff like ethylene and salicylic and abscisic acid. The plants produce these chemicals to fend off herbivorous insects that might damage their tissue, but the symbiotic fungi can also detect them, and the fungi have evolved to recognize these VOCs as signals that the plant host is in distress. The fungus can relay this chemical signal to other trees that it also has a symbiosis with. Remember, the mycelium is this broad network of hyphae, and it can connect to multiple plants at once, and in this way, it's able to act as a communication network that connects all of these plants together. The fungus is like a communication intermediary. Now, once these other trees have received this signal from the fungal intermediary, those trees and other plants will start to produce their own VOCs as a preparatory defense. So it's kind of like a communication that establishes a group defense, a zone defense, if you will. And this benefits all of the plants that the fungus is integrated with. It connects all of the plants in a sizable region, not just one plant individually. Alright, now that we're done with the, with the nice, constructive, fungal root symbiosis, I want to talk about some of the more destructive chemicals. First, I want to start with an important chemical involved in breaking down lignin, because ecologically and existentially, this chemical, in a manner of speaking, saved life on the planet Earth. And after this, I'll start talking about the dangerous mycotoxins that various fungal species produce. Alright, so I've mentioned lignin multiple times in many episodes of this podcast. I think I first talked about it in detail in the series on evolutionary history, and I talked about it a lot in the series on plants. But for your sake, I'll only briefly recap the most important details about lignin. So, lignin first evolved hundreds of millions of years ago, and it gave rise to the great forests of the Carboniferous period. This is because up until this point, land plants were limited in size. They could only grow so large, because if they got too big, their tissue wasn't strong enough to hold up their, their body weight against the forces of gravity. Lignin evolved as a complex polymer that offered greatly enhanced structural support. Strands of lignin crisscrossing into sheets formed thick, sturdy secondary cell walls, and this reinforcement of the cellular structure led to huge improvements in the strength and durability of the macroscopic plant tissue. 
Effectively, it led to the emergence of wood. Plants could now grow much taller than they had before. But there was a problem. The lignin encasing the cells protected them from being decomposed, as nothing had yet evolved to break down lignin. But eventually, some fungi evolved a set of peroxidase enzymes that acted like chemical wrecking balls. The way that these peroxidase enzymes work is that they kind of chaotically blast huge chunks out of the lignin cell wall. They, they break it apart like a wrecking ball, and they expose the softer, more digestible cellulose that lies underneath the lignin. Today, the most common type of lignin decomposing fungi are the white rot fungi, which break down woody plant tissue. This white rot fungi will secrete peroxidases, like lignin peroxidase, manganese peroxidase, and polyvalent peroxidase, among others, and these will all break down the lignin. They break down various parts of the lignin polymer. Now, as these peroxidase enzymes require the presence of peroxide to keep functioning, the fungi will also secrete accessory enzymes that can synthesize it, right there at the site of lignin breakdown. I should also mention that the cell wall of the plant isn't just pure lignin. There's also lignin derivatives. And to break these down, the fungi will also secrete various kinds of copper-based lacase enzymes. All of these enzymes working together will sufficiently degrade and destroy the lignin so that the plants can be decomposed and their carbon can be returned to the carbon cycle. In this way, the evolution of these peroxidase enzymes removed a roadblock to the, to the carbon cycle that existed during the Carboniferous period. Because before these peroxidase enzymes were evolved, but after lignin was evolved, you had all of these, these trees growing and dying, and their logs would fall all over the forest floor, and they would build up because nothing could break them down. And there was so much biomass being integrated into this woody tissue that it started to make a significant dent in the amount of circulating carbon. And the biosphere actually saw a decrease in available carbon used to sustain every other organism. If this trend continued, if these peroxidase enzymes were never evolved, then the carbon cycle would effectively shut down as all of these plants would sequester carbon and nothing could remove it. The CO2 would be taken out of the atmosphere and the earth would freeze over. So in this way, the evolution of peroxidase enzymes quite literally saved life on Earth. And the reason we're here today is because these fungi, and uh, uh, some bacteria as well, evolved these peroxidase enzymes. That's a subtle little fact about natural history that has literal world-making implications. So next time you see some white rot fungi, even though it might be destroying some plants in a forest that you like, just appreciate the, the nuance of it. Appreciate that these peroxidase enzymes saved all life on Earth. I mean, that's pretty incredible. All right, so moving on to mycotoxins. The fungi produce all manner of secondary metabolites called mycotoxins. And as the name suggests, these chemicals are toxic. Depending on the mycotoxin, a sufficient quantity can cause grievous damage to an infected organism, which can lead to agonizing symptoms, up to and including death. A parasitic fungi can use mycotoxins to weaken its host, and thus make it easier to invade and parasitize. It's much safer for the fungi to weaken the host and impair their immune system, because that way the host can't readily fight off the incoming fungal infection. For example, there are a few species of Aspergillus, Penicillium, and Bisoclamus fungi that parasitize apple trees by feeding off of the soft, sugary flesh of the apple fruit. The fungi utilize several chemicals to break down the apple, including a chemical called patulin, which is a polyketide composed of two carbon rings studded with oxygen. Patulin is produced to break down not just apples, but all kinds of fruit, including grapes, bananas, strawberries, blueberries, and cherries. Basically, every fruit that's used in flavorings, in jams, juices, wines, ciders, and pie carries the risk of patulin contamination. 
Various species of Fusarium fungi can parasitize plants by infecting the tips of their roots and creeping their hyphae filaments up the root tissue into the plant's stem. This approach uses chemical metabolites involved in both breaking down plant matter and in forming symbioses, where the symbiosis is formed not to help both the plant and the fungus, but to get the fungus inside of the plant so it can break everything down and consume it from the inside out. The fungi will steal nutrients from the plants to produce their spores, and as it does so, the lowest, oldest leaves on the plant will begin to turn yellow, curl up, and die. As the infection progresses, the fungal mycelia and its spores begin clogging up the plant's xylem tissue, and the yellowing and wilting will crawl up the plant from the roots until the entire plant dies. This is Fusarium wilt, or Panama disease, and it is a huge problem for all sorts of plants, especially agricultural plants. Fungi are detrivores, which means that they tend to eat dead stuff. And where can you find a lot of dead stuff, tightly concentrated in a dark, cool place? If you guessed food storage, you'd be correct. As humans practice agriculture, we learn to store our surplus food. As technology has advanced, food storage techniques have improved, but mistakes can still be made, and fungal spores can still find their way inside a storage unit, where they will infect the harvest. A good example of this is citronin, which is a mycotoxin produced by some Penicillium and Aspergillus species, as they tend to hang out in grain silos and eat all the grain that's being stored there. Stores of grain-based foods, like wheat, barley, rye, corn, and rice, are often sources of citronin buildup, and in large enough doses, this can be dangerous. If a small animal, like a duckling or a rabbit or a mouse, were to eat about 50 to 150 milligrams of citronin per kilogram of their body weight, they would suffer from serious poisoning, and they would probably die. Chronic exposure to citronin appears to cause inflammation in the kidneys and liver, and can even cause cancer. Now, there's another group of mycotoxins called aflatoxins, which are produced by a couple aspergillus molds as a kind of digestive metabolite. Aflatoxins are used to decompose vegetation, and they can be found in almost any vegetable that's been stored incorrectly. Aflatoxins can be found in wheat, corn, peanuts, rice, chili peppers, cotton, and a lot of other stuff. And if any of this contaminated food is processed and distributed, the risk of exposure in human populations skyrockets. This is something to be seriously concerned about, as aflatoxin exposure is linked with a wide variety of negative health outcomes, which can damage children much more than adults. Aflatoxins are carcinogenic, and they appear to really hurt the liver, which tries to filter them out. Low exposure can cause liver disease, and higher doses can cause hepatic necrosis, which leads to cirrhosis and liver cancer. Yet another group of mycotoxins are the okra toxins, and just like citronin and the aflatoxins, the okra toxins are also produced by a few Aspergillus and Penicillium species, and they're also mostly found in stored vegetables, slowly breaking down the plant tissue into a soggy, rotting mass that the fungus can easily digest. But okra toxins stand out from the others in that they can also be found in meat and animal tissue. When a mammal suffers from chronic okra toxin exposure, or a large, acute exposure to okra toxins, this can lead to kidney failure. So these are just some of the mycotoxins used to break down dead vegetable matter, or in the case of okra toxins, animal tissue. But there are some other mycotoxins that are much more dangerous. They're the chemicals that the fungi use to explicitly kill a plant or animal, so as to create a corpse that it can then saprophytically consume. Some of the fungal kingdom's more deadly mycotoxins belong to the chemical family of trichothecenes. The mechanism that makes these trichothecenes so dangerous is their ability to interfere with ribosomes and completely shut down protein synthesis. 
The inhibition of protein synthesis is more pronounced in cells that are more mitotically active. Or to put it another way, in tissues where the cells divide more often, like in the lining of the intestines or in the bone marrow, the protein synthesis suppression is more pronounced, and presumably that much more destructive to the organism. I mean, just try and imagine this. Uh, the lining of your stomach tissue, uh, those cells, that tissue, has to reproduce very frequently because the stomach acid is corrosive and it damages the cells on the inner lining of that tissue. Instead of producing cells that can just withstand the stomach acid, your, your stomach tissue just creates more, and so you have this constant turnover. But if all of this protein synthesis is shut down, that constant turnover begins to slow down and then collapse. And before you know it, you have cells in your stomach lining that are being dissolved by your own stomach acid, but they're not being replaced. And so it's only a matter of time before the stomach acid starts to burn its way through your stomach lining and you get ulcers, and then stomach acid starts to leak out into your gut, and that's just hideous and ugly and painful in so many ways. Additionally, as the trichothecenes impair protein synthesis, this will lead to a buildup of reactive oxygen species in the cells, which can cause oxidative stress, and eventually it'll induce apoptosis and kill the cells. Due to the amphipathic nature of the molecule, the trichothecenes can easily pass through the cell's membranes. They can be easily absorbed through the gut lining, through the alveoli of the lungs, and even through the skin. Trichothecene poisoning can cause intense itching and other skin problems, as well as nausea, diarrhea, coughing, throat pain, chest pain, and impaired muscle movement. The immune system can collapse. Leukopenia and granulopenia gets progressively worse and the skin and mucosal tissues start bleeding. As the mucosal tissues lining the throat and lungs are damaged and destroyed, the body becomes unable to effectively respirate, and this leads to death via asphyxiation. Now, one of these trichothecene chemicals is called diacetoxyserpenol, which is known to infect farm animals and cause a treatable kind of toxicosis. Another trichothecene is called vomitoxin, which is expressed by fusarium and gibberella fungi that infect grain. Vomitoxin is an integral part of the infection process, like in cases of head blight in wheat or ear blight in corn. If a mammal is exposed to vomitoxin, which could happen if it ate some infected grains, the chemical can cause the brain to soak up more tryptophan and produce more serotonin which can lead to anorexic behaviors where the animal barely eats. The anorexic behavior may also be partly due to gut irritation, as vomitoxin damages the soft internal tissue lining and causes ulcers. Yet another trichothecene mycotoxin, one that's much more dangerous, is called T2, which is produced by fusarium fungi. T2 is so deadly that it's been experimented with as a potential biological weapon. Upon infection with T2, a human body starts to decompose. For the first week or so, the patient feels a burning sensation in their mouth and stomach, which is followed by the bone marrow degenerating, and the skin bleeding and necrifying, the muscles necrifying, the lymph nodes swelling as the immune system collapses, and mucosal tissue across the body falls apart and becomes useless. Death usually comes from asphyxiation, either as the swollen lymph nodes close off the windpipe or as the lung mucosal tissue falls apart and bleeds its way into bronchial pneumonia. Some fusarium and gibberella species produce an estrogenic metabolite called ziarolinone. Because of ziarolinone's likeness to estrogen, it can bind to estrogen receptors and interfere with their healthy functioning. In various animal species, mostly swine like pigs and hogs, a ziarolinone infection can cause malformations of the developing sexual structures and sexual behavioral disorders. Interestingly, there's a synthetic derivative called xeranol, and it's more than three times as potent of an estrogen as the base ziarolinone. 
Xeranol is used in veterinary medicine and industrial agriculture as a growth promoter in cattle. There's a particularly potent group of heat-resistant mycotoxins called amatoxins. Amatoxins are produced by a few species of cynocybe, gallerina, and lepiota mushrooms, but they're mostly produced by the amanita mushrooms, like the amanita phalloides, which is also known as the death cap mushroom. Amatoxins are composed of eight amino acid residues clumped together in a fluffy bundle of rings, and this chemical structure allows them to bind to and inhibit RNA polymerase II. Without the RNA polymerase II, the host cells can't synthesize the bulk of RNA that it needs to stay alive. Without mRNA, for example, the cell can't express proteins. It can't make enzymes. And that alone is enough to kill the cell. But amatoxins can also do something much more visceral. Amatoxins can create gaping holes in the cell's plasma membrane, which will begin to interfere with the very basics of cellular activity. The organelles can leak out of the cell, which is akin to your body suffering catastrophic puncture damage that lets your organs slip out of your torso. Furthermore, the holes in the plasma membrane can disrupt electrochemical and concentration gradients, which are absolutely fundamental to the cell's most critical functions. And in a more general sense, when the amatoxins burn holes through the plasma membrane, the basic structural integrity of the cell becomes compromised. And unsurprisingly, this can lead to cellular collapse. In animals, amatoxins first move from the gut to the liver, and almost right away, they just start wrecking everything. Remember that these amatoxins are heat-tolerant, so they aren't readily destroyed by a fever. Instead, the amatoxins will persist and rapidly damage the liver cells. This first causes hepatitis, or inflammation of the liver, which will impair the liver's function and can lead to centrolobular necrosis. Lipid molecules aren't processed, and they build up in the liver tissue to create hepatic steatosis. The damage spreads to the kidneys, causing nephropathy, and by now, the poor infected animal is suffering from intense hepatorenal syndrome. The kidneys will fail as the nephrons are destroyed, hepatocytes are destroyed, and the liver will just dissolve into a mushy pile of goo, and then death will come right around the corner and end the intense and rapid infection. If the infected animal in question is a human, Death can be prevented if treatment happens really quickly, like within the first day. If the infected animal is some poor beast out there in the wilderness, it's doomed. The amatoxins will take its life and render its body down into a lump of accessible nutrients that the fungi can then saprophytically digest. Amatoxins are the real deal. These are powerful substances that are evolutionarily designed to kill quickly. From a certain ecological perspective, it's not entirely inaccurate to say that these fungi fill a kind of predatory niche. They are fungal predators. Although it's probably much more accurate to say that these are defensive compounds. After all, an animal would only be ingesting amatoxins if it was eating a fungus's body. What better way to discourage having your body eaten than to make yourself really stupidly dangerously toxic? A lot of the toxins that I've talked about so far in this later half of the episode damage the tissues of plants and macroscopic animals. But what about the smaller animals, like insects or arachnids, that also want to eat the soft tissue of the fungi? Or what about even smaller organisms, like bacteria, that want to infect the fungi? Well, as I'll briefly describe, fungi also produce chemicals to fight off these little guys, too. Penicillin is a powerful antibacterial agent that was first discovered in a fungal mold, but I'll talk about that when I talk about human medicinal uses for fungi. For now, I'll just say that the penicillin works by arresting the bacterial enzymes involved in peptidoglycan synthesis, which they use as part of their cell walls. 
Penicillin, thus, disrupts the ability of the bacteria to maintain its cell wall, which leads to cell wall degradation and the eventual death of the bacteria. Now here's something that's super badass. Single-celled bacteria can live in colonies, and these bacteria can communicate with each other through a mysterious process called quorum sensing, where the colony is able to behave and interact with its environment as if it was a singular organism. Some fungi, like the Caprophilus ink cap mushroom, can produce lactinase molecules that intercept and absorb these quorum signals. This interception will disrupt the quorum sensing and the communication of the bacterial colony, and so it impairs the bacteria's ability to cooperate and interfere with the fungi. Similarly, there's an Aspergillus mold species that can produce lactinases that interfere with the juvenile hormones of insects. This hormonal interference will disrupt the proper hormonal patterning and physical development of the insect, and it will either kill it outright or produce a mature adult that's deformed and unable to do work effectively. This will harm the vitality of the insect's colony and impair its ability to be a predator of the fungus. Now, fungi also need to protect themselves from other fungi, and so they've evolved a variety of antifungal compounds. Now, it might seem a little counterintuitive that fungi would produce antifungal compounds, but it's true. Examples include the lipopeptide pneumocandin B0, produced by the Glaria lozoiensis, and the octopeptide alpha amanitin, which is produced by various species of Amanita, Sinusibe, Lepiota, and Gallerina species. Similar to the general strategy of penicillin, these antifungal compounds impair some of the enzymes involved in building the fungus's chitinous cell walls and thus will degrade the structural integrity of the invading fungal tissue until it's destroyed. Alright, so I talked a lot about the chemicals that fungi use to interact with plants, whether it be to form a symbiosis or to parasitize them and break down their tissues. I also talked about the mycotoxins that damage plants and animals alike, and the chemicals that are used to deter bugs and microbes and even other fungi. But what about the strictly beneficial chemicals? What about the medicines derived from fungal compounds? There's a lot of chemicals that fungi produce that we humans use for medicine. These include the cyclosporins and the cephalosporins, lovastatin, griseofulvin, penicillin, and many others. There's a select number of fungal chemicals that have incredible effects on human neurochemistry, like the lysergic acid from ergot, and the psilocybin and the psilocin from various species of psychedelic mushrooms. All of these chemical compounds are all extremely fascinating and very important to human life, which is why I didn't really talk about them that much today, and I'll instead talk about them in a later episode on humans and fungi, and that'll be episode 72. But for now, this is all that I have for you today. This was a fun little episode that sprinted through some of the major groups of chemicals that fungi use to engage with the world around them, either through symbiosis, parasitism, or saprophytic feeding. If you like this episode, then give it a like and share it with a friend. And if you've been enjoying this whole series on fungal physiology, then hit the subscribe button so you can see the next episode right when it's released. The next episode, episode 64, will be all about fungal sensoria, or the ways in which the fungi sense and perceive the world around them. It will definitely overlap with some of the stuff I talked about today, but it will introduce a whole lot of new stuff too, so be sure to check it out. And as always, thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.